Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. My name is Sarah. I'm with the Park, Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation. Uh, and joining me today is Steve Ziegler. He's with the, De the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources um, in the Bureau of Forestry. Welcome, Steve. Good afternoon. So I just want to remind our viewers today that if you have any questions during the presentation, please leave them in the comments below and we'll address them um, throughout the Lunch and Learn today. All right, Steve, so I understand you have a presentation for us, so I'm going to toss it over to you. Take it away. Okay. Try and put the PowerPoint up here. Hopefully it works for everybody. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about wildfire safety and uh, prevention, mainly talking about debris burning and uh, campfire safety. Sure. So I'm uh, Steve Ziegler. I'm a service forester in the Wiser Forest District. Uh, I also spent two years as the fire forester there. Uh, so a little bit of experience in the, the fire side of things. Just want to pause right there, Steve, um, if you could share your screen. Oh, yeah, that would help. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> there we go. Okay, sorry about that. No, I'm totally fine. Feel All fine. right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, again, serves forestry right now uh, for the Wiser Forest District. A uh, little bit of experience there with uh, the fire side of things as a fire forester. Um, but today we're going to talk a little bit about trying to prevent some of the fires that we wind up going out to, to try to uh, put out that wind up in the in the forest. So here's a little overview of what uh, we'll talk about today. We have a scenario that I'm going to run through, uh, talk about debris burning, different examples of that, um, and steps to do it safely. Uh, we'll also have some campfire safety tips, and then just going to throw out some of the fire statistics that we've had uh, for 2020 alone, just to show you the extra, a little bit extra on the importance of why this is so important to be safe when we're doing debris burning and campfire safety as those are our number one causes for the fires that we have to go out and suppress. So we'll get into a little bit here. So for our scenario, it's a sunny day, no clouds in the sky as you see in the picture here. Leaves are off the trees. A lot of times we'll see this in the typical springtime setting before our trees leaf out. And then here in a couple weeks, our leaves are changing colors right now, but uh, they're gonna be dropping those leaves to the forest floor and it's gonna look like this for, for the winter again. So this is just around the corner. We're gonna be, be running into this. Flags are standing straight out. We have winds 15 miles an hour, a pretty windy day like we typically see these times of year. We had warm temperatures for several days, uh, days in the 50s and 60s, no precipitation at all, no rain, no snow. While we're walking through the woods, we hear that crackle and crunch with every step. Uh, a lot of springtime hikes when we're out there, we hear that crackling of the leaves, and the sticks snapping underneath our feet. Uh, look, you'll have this a lot after no rain and warm days. So I went out to burn trash like I always do. I throw it in the barrel, but I can't just stand here and watch this. I got a lot of errands to do. Uh, I got some things to do inside the house. So I'm just gonna run out, run inside and come back in a couple minutes and, and check on it. When I came out, I discovered the trash had escaped out of my barrel and is now running through the woods. Uh, burning all those dry leaves that were there before. Now it's running through the woods. I got to try to stop this thing, but it's going so fast that I can't I can't catch it. It's just going so quickly. I almost lost my house. The siding was melted. Part of my porch fell off. All because my my fire escaped out into the woods and was running through those dry leaves. So debris burning, common practice, happens a lot. 
Um, the scenario I just ran through is basically how I went to my first wildfire. I was actually only 10 or 11, and my neighbor went through the exact same scenario there. And wind just happened to be burning towards our house, and luckily we were able to catch it before it got there, but uh, very similar to my very first fire that I fought. Debris burning is our number one cause of wildfires every year consistently. Um, it's very typical. You, you go out there in the spring, do your spring cleaning or cleaning up leaves this time of year, and you just want to burn them and get rid of them. They occur during our spring cleanups and fall cleanups. There's many types of debris burning. So some things we think of the typical burn barrel like in the scenario, but there's some other ways that debris is burned. So construction piles, um, this is a big one that uh, we really shouldn't be doing. A lot of the stuff from construction falls under DEP's rules of stuff that shouldn't be burned. Um, but unfortunately, you still have this. It's a quick way to, as long as everything goes right, it's a quick way to get rid of the construction debris. Household trash. Um, fortunately, driving around, I see uh, a lot of these piles sitting outside in people's homes and um, just waiting for the wrong day for them to go out and try to burn that stuff. Leaves and brush piles, that's a big one this time of year. Like I said, with uh, the leaves going to be falling off the trees here, and um, we hate seeing that the leaves in our yard sometimes and just want to get rid of them quick. So we'll put them on a big pile and burn them all at one shot, and they're gone. So what was wrong with our scenario that we had gone through there a little bit ago? It was a windy day. Um, much like most of our spring days, you have a little bit of wind gust. Um, that just helps to, to dry the vegetation. We had uh, no precipitation, so that vegetation is extra dry and crispy uh, under our feet. Um, location, so it was a, on the side of a, a hill there. You had some good steep slope behind the house. Um, a lot of times on our south side, we get a lot more sun into those areas. Uh, time of day, we're going out and burning in the afternoon, uh, really not a good idea. It's the hottest time of the day. Uh, we had all morning for stuff to dry out from a morning dew. Uh, we've even had times where it rained a little bit overnight or into the morning and that sun comes out and dries things up with the wind and uh, that afternoon we got brush fires going from debris piles. Um, so we left it unattended. Uh, it's never a good idea. It can happen real quick. You get one gust of wind comes and blows one tiny ember out of your barrel, and it can move real fast because all the stuff we've already talked about. Uh, area around the fire is not cleared. Um, so you have your trash in the barrel, but you didn't get a chance to clean up the leaves. Uh, all it takes is that spark get into the leaves right next to your barrel, and you're going to be in this, unfortunately, living through this scenario. Um, having no water on scene, so like I say, it's just one tiny ember is all it takes sometimes, and if you have a bucket of water there, you can, can take care of it before it starts running through the woods. And having your fire too close to a structure, uh, you're just kind of setting yourself up for failure. Um, not much wiggle room there if it does get out to uh, just run through the grass and wind up right next to your house, which probably has a lot of stuff that is very flammable and will light really quickly as well. So here's a picture of a, a safe debris burner. And we're gonna go through, through some of the things that he's done right in this picture to make sure he's not chasing a fire through the woods behind him or calling 911 to come help put the fire out. Uh, so you can see the grass area around him here. He's taking the time ahead of time to Clean out all these leaves. If you have a place that you burn quite often, it's even better if you can get rid of this grass too. Just get it down to bare dirt. Um, that just increases your chance. But you should have 10 feet uh, radius all the way around your burn barrel before you even start 
thinking about trying to burn your trash in this situation. You see, it has a metal container, much like the one in our example. But there's a couple of things that went into this barrel. The one from our example had really big holes in the sides of it, which you need for getting air in so that the stuff can, can actually burn inside the barrel. Um, but there's ways of putting those holes in there that are going to help you out to uh, make sure it doesn't escape like the one in the example. So we see half inch holes at the bases. They're not the giant holes that were all the way up the side of the barrel. So this allows the air in the bottom. And then there's these metal rebar pieces going through. So the trash is sitting on top of that. It's not all the way down in the barrel where it's going to shoot out the holes at the bottom. And it just slowly lets the stuff burn down and let the ashes drop to the bottom. It has a screen on top. So this is a pretty key thing. They say you have an ember that uh, though you get a good wind coming through, it'll wind up going right through the top of an open barrel. But if you have a screen mesh across the top, it stops that ember from, from being able to escape and getting out into the leaves. So he's got a hose in his hand here and a rake. So he already raked those leaves back. Um, but having that hose there, you're able to, to hit that little spark as it if it jumps out, uh, you can rake the leaves around the, that hot ember to make sure it doesn't catch more stuff on fire. So if you don't have a hose easily accessible, like I said, a bucket of even just having a bucket of water there can can be pretty handy. Here's just some things that you want to check before you go out there and start burning your your debris. So are there, first thing to check, are there any burn bans or local ordinances prohibiting open burning? Um, so like I said before, uh, with stuff that DEP doesn't let you burn, a lot of those construction materials, uh, a lot of those also fall under ordinances within your township or municipality. Um, that's something in the place I live, we have ordinances in place so that the only thing really burning is wood. You're not really even um, really allowed to burn leaves technically under the ordinance. Uh, burn bans, this is something you definitely want to look into. I know over the summer here we had some areas that weren't receiving a whole lot of rainwater, um, so they were in drought conditions and some counties actually put burn bans in over the summer. Uh, a lot of times we'll see March and April are most active months. Uh, the counties I work in, they're pretty proactive in getting burn bans out. And it, it does make a big difference in the number of fires that we're going to wind up reporting to, responding to. Uh, big help on, on everybody involved with putting the fires out. Uh, make sure you're checking what the weather looks like. Uh, perfect day to burn is often the wrong day to burn. So you think of a nice day where it's nice and sunny out. It's nice. You don't even need a sweatshirt maybe to go out and do your stuff outside. Unfortunately, those warm days, as we discussed, is going to dry everything out around you and uh, put you at more risk for having a wildfire on your hands instead of a, just a debris fire. So sometimes those rainy days where it doesn't look like you really want to be out there, that's when you actually want to go out and, and start burning that trash if, if you're going to go that route. Uh, so where is the burn barrel or fire located? You have that cleared area like we saw in the picture there where you cleared the leaves back. Um, get away from your house. Uh, having it right next to your house, you can burn siding off real quick just from the pile that you're burning, let alone if it gets out into a, and forms a wildfire. Uh, put it on next to a wooded area. I see this so often. People just put their, their piles right next to the woods, right where all those dry leaves and sticks are that were crunching under our feet earlier, they're putting it right next to that and, and burning their burning their debris. And the flammable material nearby, so it kind of falls under the wooded area as well. And uh, also gas cans and anything like that that you might have in the area where you plan on burning. A good thing to check would be the fire danger. Um, in this case, it's listed as low. Uh, that's something you can check with your local 
uh, forest district or a lot of times these signs are out and about within the community. Uh, we have a lot of fire companies that keep up with the fire danger sign. All of our forestry offices have the sign out front that's updated daily, uh, especially during the, the burn periods in the spring and fall. We're really keeping track of our fire danger and getting that out so people know. So a low day, well, it does sound like a, a good day to burn, but it's not a day where you can just go into it blind and uh, kind of throw caution to the wind and burn. We still always have that risk. As soon as you light up uh, your match or lighter to start your debris fire, you're running that chance of having fire get away from you and uh, having to call 911 for help to put out uh, a wildfire. So it impacts more than just homeowners. This picture here is a fire from Schuylkill County here where I, where I work. Um, went up a steep slope. You can see in the picture it's impacting the uh, um, high tension wires going up through there. That adds a uh, different aspect for the people trying to put the fire out, working around the electric. But you can see it burned up quite a bit of bit of woods in the picture here. So in the scenario earlier. You affected your house by melting the siding off and the see the porch railing fell off but uh it's not always just your your stuff that's getting burned so you have your neighbor's property to worry about and then uh, the potential of going to court or to court over burning your debris it got away from you and burned something of your neighbors uh, in the case of the fire that i talked about where i was my first one uh, it wound up burning a whole bunch of trees in our yard and almost burned uh, the shed down uh, next to our neighbor's property. Um, so his carelessness almost cost us a lot uh, with our trees and that shed. Uh, private and state forests, so not just their uh, houses, your neighbor's house or something. You can also you're going to be burning their through their woods, um, timber values if they're managing their forests for for timbering, um, running through a running a fire through there, a lot of times you'll wind up with people who aren't going to want that want those trees if they look to do a timber harvest. So you have the value of the trees that you might be responsible um, for replacing the the costs of that, and then also burning it onto our our state forests. Uh, as many of you who use our state forests know, a lot of them are in very remote areas, so. We get a wildfire burning on the state forest. It's a lot of times it's hard to get there to try to put those out. And then all the resources out there are hiking trails and everything. It's put in danger. You have somebody out using the state forest and doesn't know the fire's coming. Uh, There's just a whole lot of uh, resources at risk getting out into private and state forest lands. The vehicles. Sometimes they wind up starting the fires, but sometimes they're a, a byproduct. You have them um, sitting around in the driveway and uh, wind up burning your vehicle up. So then you're going through insurance claims with that and then trying to replace a vehicle. Uh, so it throws an extra hardship that you wouldn't necessarily need just because you wanted to get rid of a pile of leaves. Oh, wildlife. So hopefully everybody's familiar with Smokey Bear and the story of how he got trapped in the, the wildfire and uh, went on to try to prevent wildfires. Um, so there's a lot of wildlife resources that are, are put at risk. Um, springtime, you see the turkeys with the little ones here. Um, you're, that's the prime nesting period. You see the eggs in the lower left corner. Um, so it's, Unfortunately, we wind up losing a lot of these ground nesting birds, lose their nests. Uh, rattlesnake in the picture, hard for them to escape sometimes once a, a fire starts coming through. And uh, just in general, a lot of wildlife wind up getting stuck in these situations with uh, the fire burning through their home. So something else that uh, winds up at risk is our firefighters. Uh, so DC and our response to a lot of uh, wildfires themselves. Well, but the big thing is our local volunteer fire companies are having to come out here and respond because your debris fire got out of the 
got out of hand and they have to come try to help put this thing out. So in addition to house fires and vehicle accidents and everything else that our local volunteers have to come out and take care of, now they have to come out and chase a fire and uh, sometimes not the best areas. Like this uh, picture earlier, it's going up a steep slope and they're putting a lot of effort into trying to, to put this fire out. And it also takes them away from all the other emergencies that they're responsible for uh, showing up at. Then you get something added to a year like this year with COVID. Uh, you can see in the picture where everybody's working here uh, close together. They're trying to put fire line in. This year we just had that added uh, thing of COVID where one person has it here. More than likely that whole fire company is going to wind up getting it or they're going to be quarantined and not able to come out and uh, assist with their other emergencies as well. So just uh, an added hazard in addition to worrying about the fire that uh, we said before, it can move really fast through the woods and uh, a lot of things to worry about when you're trying to put out a fire of these magnitudes. Uh, it's out in the wilderness and can do pretty much whatever it wants and they're out there trying to make sure it doesn't make it to your neighbor's house or wind up in your, your home. So can you really afford just by going out there to burn your debris to start a wildfire? So in this case, if DCNR winds up coming out to suppress the fire, you're gonna be responsible for the, the costs of the employees, the equipment that they have to use. Um, in the case of the fire earlier, uh, bulldozers could be brought in to try to build line around the, the fire. And as long as they're out there, you're going to wind up paying for the time that that equipment's out there trying to suppress your fire. The picture on the right here, uh, Pennsylvania does have contracted airplanes that help to drop water on the fire. And each one of those drops can get up to uh, $600 a drop every time they come out. So it can rack up quite a bill in a hurry um, if it gets away out of the, the initial response of the fire company. Well, I've got a lot of good alternatives to debris burning. Uh, it's really hard to start a wildfire if you're not going to be out there burning this stuff. So some alternatives, recycling uh, is a real good alternative. A lot of uh, municipalities offer it. Uh, to the people who live there for free or at a small fee. Brush piles. So in the case here, we stack the branches up in the, the woods. This can wind up turning into a good habitat for rabbits and uh, other mammals to, to live in these things as opposed to burning them up. Uh, so it creates some habitat instead of having a fire get out and destroy habitat, you're actually creating more. Uh, chipping and mulching. So you could chip some of this materials up, wind up using it as mulch for your yard or uh, easier way to get rid of it. Composting is another good way to get rid of some things. I always uh, blow all the leaves out of my yard into uh, my garden and let them uh, kind of help the soil in, in my garden. So composting is a good way to get rid of that stuff. Uh, municipal dumps. Um, so uh, a lot of times uh, you can just have the trash service send it off to, fortunately it's in a dump, but at the same time it's not burning up habitat or uh, putting yourself in danger. So going from uh, debris burning to something that a lot of us probably like to do uh, when we're out recreating, uh, if it is on state forest or wherever you like to go out and hike and camp. A lot of us like to have campfires. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about how to have a, a safe campfire. A lot of this will uh, kind of echo what I said about debris burning, but uh, there are some extra steps uh, you can take uh, if you're out having your campfire. So hopefully this video works. I have a short video that the Bureau of Forestry put together a couple years ago on how to have a campfire and not a wildfire.
We'll maybe click it again. Is it working now? I'm not seeing it, but it's possible it's like popping up um, like behind your PowerPoint, okay. like opening a new tab. Uh, wait a second here. I have it on my desktop too. I could try that way. Okay. Is that working? There we go. Okay. Yeah, I see it. If you want to just click. Try play one more time. Oh, I guess it is going, but I don't hear. Hmm. It looks like it is playing, but I'm not hearing oh, okay. anything if there should be audio. Do you have a, a separate link for to it? We can oh, yeah. share it yeah, after share the that. webinar. Cool. Awesome. Right. Awesome. Let's see if I can get out of it here. All right, so we'll move on from the video since it doesn't want to work. We can share that then. Awesome. But uh, pretty much with our campfires, we're looking at a lot of the same things we were doing with our uh, debris fires. So you can see in the picture here a little bit, we have uh, that spacing, the 10 foot spacing around it again. So we're Getting all those leaves and stuff that can quickly ignite outside of the fire, we're getting that back away from away from it. So we can get our chairs in these areas. And in that case, you don't have to worry about falling over sticks and things when you're getting up and walking around your campfire, but you're also not having that fire get out into the area adjacent to the fire. So we're out having a campfire. We don't really want to hike in with a burn barrel on our back. Um, uh, it's not what we really like to sit around anyway and cook our marshmallows or hot dogs around. So in this case, we're forming a barrier with some rocks. So we have a nice solid circle. There is still some gaps in here for air to get in to, to help the stuff burn that you're, you have in the fire ring. Uh, we're not burning trash in these. So the only wood should be going into your campfires. Uh, having that extra debris in there a lot of stuff we shouldn't be burning anyway and uh, again you don't really want to cook food over a trash fire anyway uh, so we're only burning wood in here uh, if you can i know sometimes we're out in remote areas on trails but if you can have a bucket of water handy to, if something does escape you can quickly put some water on it and then at the end of the night, we're going to want to make sure our campfire is out. So you're going to want to put water on it. Uh, if you don't have any water nearby, a uh, good way is spread the stuff out inside the rocks here and try to get bare mineral dirt. Just get some good dirt, throw it on there and mix it around. Uh, it's amazing how much uh, you can cool down a fire just by putting, throwing dirt on it and mixing it up. A lot of times when we're fighting fires, that we're in areas that we can't get water to. Um, so to cool it down, we're using dirt to, to cool the embers down that way. Um, and like I say, stir it up and make sure it's good and cold before you go back into your tent or go into your house uh, and leave it unattended. So we don't want to leave it unattended, but at the end of the night, make sure it's good and cold so you can actually leave your fire. Uh, if it's too too hot to touch, then it's too hot to leave it there. Keep trying to cool it down from there. Uh, I do programs for kids. I always say you like making mud. That's what you got to do to make sure your your fire is good and cold at the end of the night. So make mud or stir some dirt in there and make sure it's good and cold so you don't have to worry about it. 
Oh, so here's some some quick rules here. So drown the make sure your campfire is at it. Make sure it's dead out at the end of the night. Drown it. Throw as much water on it as you can. Uh, if you have a hose there, just keep drowning it with water. Uh, stir it up. So like I said, grab a stick or if you have a shovel, just keep stirring it up. Add water, stir it up, and make sure all the burn material is out cold. And feel the materials with your bare hand. And if it's too hot to touch, keep on, go back to step one and keep working at it. So another thing here in the picture here, when you're feeling this stuff to make sure it's cold, uh, you can see in the picture here, the person's using the back of their hand. That's another important thing to remember when you're trying to make sure stuff is, something isn't hot. Uh, if you flip your hand over and go the other way, if it is hot, your first reaction is to wind up grabbing that hot material and making it worse where use the back of your hand you're gonna pull away from the, the hot material so uh, that's a good illustration there to make sure you're using the back of your hand to test this stuff so we'll go through a little bit about the some of the statistics from this is from 2020 as of yesterday uh, these are the wildfire statistics for Pennsylvania alone um, so year to date we've had uh almost 1200 fires uh burning 1751 acres um, so this year was pretty active in some parts of the state we had a really active spring and if you look down at the red boxes here you can see um leading as it is almost every year debris burning by a, a large margin is uh 651 fires were caused by uh debris burning so sometimes you can do everything right but a lot of times we see those piles in people's yards or right up against the woods, and it just winds up getting away from them. So make sure it's important to be picking the right days there and just know that there's always that risk that you can do everything right and it'll still wind up getting away from you and into the woods causing a wildfire. And you can see 55 fires were caused by campfires. So 60% of the fires that uh, were responded to within Pennsylvania were of these two categories alone. So if we can try to eliminate some of those, it would be a, a huge help to not only DCNR, but we look at the volunteer resources that they leave their jobs to come out and try to put these fires out, or they leave their homes, their families to try to put their lives in uh, in danger there, just trying to put out a fire that that could have been stopped before it even started. So it's real important to, to remember these tips when you go out this fall and you think about burning your leaves up. Uh, maybe just think about the people coming out to respond. If it would get away from me, all the other hazards we've talked about, and maybe just compost those leaves and use them in another way or blow them into the woods so they can add to the duff layer in the woods. Um, so another thing that's pretty important with these statistics, if you look through them down here in the bottom, uh, you see two fatalities from wildfires. So on on average, we'll have three to four fatalities a year uh, from people trying to, a lot of times they try to stop the fire once it starts. Um, I know I, when I was fire forester, we had one in our in my county that the person was had multiple fires going. They had multiple piles and they just started all go going into the woods and they wound up overcome by the smoke. So it's best in those situations, once it starts getting away out of there, once it leaves your burn barrel, important just go to the phone and call 911 and uh, personnel will come out and uh, take care of the fire. Uh, so you're not putting yourself at risk. So along with the fatalities, you also have injuries. Uh, a lot of structures damaged and destroyed. Most of these were from the debris burning because they're starting so close to houses. Uh, it doesn't take long for something to be threatened or damaged and then even destroyed. As I said earlier, contact your local Bureau of Forestry office if you need further assistance or just to call and say, what's the, what's the fire danger for today? It's just a, a simple question that if they tell you uh, we're at a high danger today, you definitely don't want to be out burning your trash and 
uh, taking that extra risk. So with that, I think I'll open it up to questions. Okay, thank you so much, Steve. Um, yes, just a reminder to viewers, if you do have a question about that presentation or, wild, or wildfires in general, just go ahead and leave them in the comments and we can get to them. I have a couple questions though. Um, are there any regulations about who can start a fire in the forest? Do you have to be camping or can you just start a fire on a day trip? What are the guidelines and regulations about starting a fire in the forest? Uh, as long as you're you're out hiking and uh, I think uh, it's the fire danger is less than a high, you're able to, to have a fire out in the woods. Uh, a lot of our campsites, we have those designated rings that you can actually put the fire in itself, but make sure you're making at least that stone barrier if you are out and about and want to have a fire. Nice. And can you typically tell the source of a fire? You mentioned that people will be held financially responsible. So how often are you able to pinpoint the exact like uh, source of, of a wildfire? Uh, yeah, uh, it's pretty common. So all the those fires that were reported on the statistics there, uh, we have fire wardens that are trained in investigating. And then uh, each county has a fire forester assigned to it. And they're trained uh, to national standards on fire investigation. So they're able to follow uh, signs. In fact, uh, you have charring on trees or the way certain things burn, you can gives you a direction of where that stuff came from. And they can actually come back and follow it back to that starting point. Uh, and if it's beyond something that they're able to figure out, we also have a state investigator that'll come out and and assist our fire foresters with trying to pinpoint where exactly stuff started from uh, a lot of times the campfires and debris burning is pretty easy but we'll have fires that are started from a uh, piece of metal out of your uh, out of your vehicle that gets out into the grass a hot piece of metal and those are can be hard to pinpoint where exactly it started but uh, there's indicators that you can follow back to to pinpoint an area where it at least started Sure. So we've gone to court and um, had to had to represent the bureau in court over some of these things. And luckily, we have these trained investigators there for those moments. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I'll find you. So um, <laughs> if we are walking through the woods or the forest and we see uh, a fire that we may think you know is isn't properly contained or perhaps will be a problem or even we stumble across a wildfire, what's our first step? Who do we call? Who do we inform? Yeah, uh, first step, it's definitely calling 911 if it's out and it's a wildfire that's moving into the woods. So then the county can dispatch resources to make sure that fire doesn't keep moving through the woods. Uh, I'd say if it's a, a campfire on state forest, if it's something that is within a ring and you think you can throw some dirt on it and get a good and cold try to do that yourself mm -hmm. uh if not call the the forest district office or the state park or wherever you're wherever you're in and we can send an employee out to, to take care of that problem yeah you, the biggest uh, thing the biggest thing there is if it is out in a wildfire don't try to if it's getting away moving quickly don't put yourself in harm's way trying to put that fire out Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned the dangers of smoke inhalation. So what precautions can someone take if they are deciding to burn some debris responsibly? Um, what uh, what steps can they take to sort of keep their lungs safe? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If everybody else is like me and you're sitting around a campfire. The smoke always seems to find you and you have to move your chair. Yeah. Uh, but, is it no. true that smoke goes towards beauty, or is that just something they say to make you feel better? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It seems to find me. So I'm right, sure. exactly. Same. <laughs> I think it's true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, the best would be to try to stay on the upwind side of of what you're burning. Um, wearing a mask could help filter some stuff out. So, in our case, when we're out on the fire line, we have masks that we can wear that are carbon filters. So it filters some of that stuff out, so we're not breathing it all in all the time. Um, so that would that would help as well. Great. We do have a question um, that came in from Mark. He he says that 
um, arson was not listed in the statistics we showed. Um, any idea on the numbers for that? I know of at least one we worked on in the last three years in Center County. That's a great point. Um, purposeful fires. Um, how often is that a problem? Yeah, I can. Uh, I'll go back and we'll go over that a little bit here. Uh, that's actually listed as incendiary on here. Okay. Um, so the, all the ones listed for incendiary is actually considered arson. Oh, here, let me show you. So it's. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, so we had uh, 114 fires that were arson fires within the state um, for 81 acres. I know that's something that we have a lot of in uh, the counties I cover. Uh, it almost seems like it's passed down from generation to generation to just go out and light the woods on fire for whatever reason. Uh, a lot of times people were doing it for uh, blueberry production, so they'd burn a section off the help bring more wildlife in or have blueberries for themselves, but it just seems like it's passed down from generation. To, uh, we're gonna go out, these fires wind up in the same places as you've had years before, and uh, they just go out and light the woods on fire. I don't know what draws them to doing something like that, but it is a serious problem in some of the areas that we cover. And if you get uh, somebody who, starts to light fires like that they start out with one and it just progresses into uh, they'll light three at the same time and you can get spread really thin really quickly with the arson problem absolutely absolutely that's a shame is there anything else you think folks should know about wildfire safety before i let you go steve uh, uh, i'm not sure i think mean, biggest thing there was uh Maybe find uh, alternatives if you're going to debrief, have a debris fire. Mm -hmm. um, that's the biggest thing I think is look at the cost of getting somebody to come pick up my trash as compared to uh, lighting it in the back backyard. And you have all the monetary things at risk, the habitat, uh, everything around you being put at risk just because you want to get rid of your trash. Uh, I don't think it's really worth it. So to try to find alternatives. Um, and biggest thing, if you do have one that starts to get away from you, uh, like I say you can do everything we talked about in the presentation here perfect and still wind up having a fire get away from you. Just make sure you're calling 911, getting those trained people out there to put it out and not putting yourself at more risk. Absolutely. That's great advice. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Steve. Um, remember to send me that video and I will share it um, with our viewers here so folks can, can watch that later on their own. But we also wanna thank everyone for uh, being with us here today during the Lunch and Learn. Uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.